This isn't just a locomotive, it's THE locomotive. If you were any kind of respectable railroad, you had at least a few of these locomotives on your roster from the late 60s for its earlier versions until well into the 90s. This locomotive would also be a much more aggressive counterattack by EMD against GE in the horsepower duel that the two now surviving railway locomotive manufacturers were engaged in for several years. This is the EMD SD40 series of locomotives. EMD had long since played it very safe with the development of its diesel locomotives, avoiding high-tech whiz-bang gizmos such as turbocharging and four-cycle combustion, and for good reason. This simplicity had served the company very well, with, for example, the company's early route switchers such as the 1949 introduced GP7, selling 2,729 units, in sharp contrast to Alco's RS3, its then-current road switcher model, which only sold 1,418 units, despite the fact that it outpowered the GP7 by 100 horsepower. AMD's GP9, the successor to the GP7, was more of the same. Introduced in 1954, now producing 1,750 horsepower thanks to enhancements in the 567 two-cycle combustion prime mover, which earned it a redesignation as the C variant, Sales for this locomotive, again by itself from the GP7, ballooned to 4,272. To put all this into perspective as to just how far EMD had left Alco in the dust, the company's competing Alco RS11 only matched to sell just under 500 units. And this is despite the fact that it produced 50 more horsepower than the GP9, and was also noticeably more fuel efficient than the GP9. Then, when GE threw its own hat in the ring, finally divorcing itself from Alco and their partnership, introducing its first domestic road switcher known as the U25B, which made it even 2,500 horsepower, and featured a pressurized engine compartment and sophisticated cooling system to keep the electronics cool, EMD responded to this threat with the GP30. While its name implies 3,000 horsepower, in fact, the locomotive made far less, only making 2,250 horsepower as this was the limit as to how far the 567D could be pushed at that time. Interesting note, the GP30's name actually came from the enhancements the locomotive had, including the pressurized engine compartment and other such features, not its horsepower rating. And yet, once again, despite the fact that this locomotive did not match the horsepower output of its competition, the GP30 easily outselled the U25B with 948 units, to the U25B's 478 units. Again, the simplicity as well as reliability of the EMD products slash locomotives kept them on top, even if they weren't actually quite in par in terms of specifications to competitors' products. EMD would finally get its 567D to 2500 horsepower with the introduction of the GP35 in 1963, which incidentally sold 1,334 units. Using a well-accepted industry logic, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, the company stuck with its 567 power plant, which in itself was also helping to drive sales, as all of the new products' parts would be compatible, at least to a certain extent, with some of the older parts from earlier locomotives, making them easier again to get parts for, or even upgrade. All this said, and despite the fact that EMD's products had such a wonderful reputation for being highly reliable, as well as simplistic in terms of maintenance and repairs, the company began to face intense pressure to upgrade the horsepower outputs of its locomotives. With GE or General Electric continuing to push out new models of its Universal or U-Boat series as they're known, each one with notably more horsepower than the last. It was around this time that EMD also began to notice a bit of a trend, the six-axle locomotive. For the longest time, U.S. railroads had been slow to adapt six-axle locomotives, at least as a main source of motive power. Six-axle units were largely confined to niches, such as working on very light rail, where the extra axle would help transfer the weight of the locomotive, or on notably steep sections of railroads where the extra tractive effort from the extra two axles would be much appreciated, not to mention a necessity, a main issue being the fact that they would require more maintenance than a four-axle locomotive. This is despite the fact that even though they were higher on maintenance, they would be able to do much more at the same time, able to drag long hauls up steep grades, as well as getting a heavy train started much easier. Now, however, with a new generation in charge, 
the six-axle locomotive was finally getting the demand, not to mention the respect it deserved. Much like GE, who marketed its locomotives that had six axles with a C designation, EMD had its own line of six-axle engines, which were essentially based upon its four-axle units, in this case marketed under the SD brand for special duty, whereas GP meant general purpose. And so, wanting to get one step ahead of GE for a change, EMD would start development of a whole new family of locomotives in the early 1960s, known as the 40 series. Unlike previous GM products, this particular locomotive would start from scratch, with an entirely new prime mover being developed for it called the 645. Now, admittedly, this prime mover was designed to be as compatible with the 567 as possible, as some of the internal components from the new prime mover would actually fit into the old prime mover allowing it to be easily upgraded. This will allow GM to take advantage of its install base, if you will, allowing customers who had owned the previous 567 Prime Mover to easily make upgrades to these Prime Movers using modern 645 component parts. This would also allow EMD to offer factory rebuild programs for existing models at a very reasonable cost, something that would become quite popular in later years. The 645 would essentially maintain the general blueprint, if you will, of the 567. It was, just like the 567, two-cycle combustion and capable of being turbocharged. Using the same trickery EMD had utilized in the 567D with a geared turbocharger that would be actually driven by the engine at lower RPMs with two turbine valves that would remain open during this period in time until the engine reached sufficient RPMs. Once this happened, the geared clutch would disengage and again, these valves would shut, diverting the spent exhaust into the turbine chamber of the turbocharger, allowing the turbo to function like a traditional turbocharger, giving the locomotive the advantage essentially of a supercharger, that is to say, little to no lag, but with the horsepower output and efficiency of a turbocharger. It's important to note that again, this was necessitated by the fact that the two-cycle combustion diesel prime movers EMD built had no way of recirculating exhaust gases to allow the combustion system to work correctly due to the two strokes that were emitted in the two-cycle combustion system being that of the exhaust gas redistribution. And thus, this clever invention was more a requirement than it was actually an enhancement. And once again, like the 567 models that were not turbocharged, the 645 models that did not feature a turbocharger would instead feature a roots blower, aka a supercharger, which would force-feed the exhaust gases back into the prime mover, essentially doing what the extra two cycles of combustion would do on a four-cycle prime mover. Unlike the 567, however, the 645 could accept up to 20 cylinders. This is to help EMD deal with ever-increasing horsepower targets being forced upon it by GE and its ever-more-powerful locomotive models. Propelled by its FDL-16 and soon-to-be-released 7 FDL-16 Prime Movers, which were again 4-cycle combustion and turbocharged. Again, GM stuck with what it knew worked, and kept things as simple as possible. Now, in retrospect, with the massive fuel crisis that the United States was about to experience, and the notable less efficient nature of the 2-cycle combustion Prime Movers, it's easy to mock GM for making such a foolish decision in designing gas-guzzling prime movers for this period in time. However, at this point in the 1960s, fuel was cheap, and of allowing the fuel consumption on these prime movers to stay high, with the trade-off being very inexpensive maintenance and extreme reliability compared to its competitors, which had in the past allowed GM's products to outsell the competition easily by 2 to 1, even if the said locomotives could not match the horsepower output of the competitors' products, it made perfect sense for GM to follow this particular path. The first of these would debut in 1965, being the GP40, largely based upon its predecessor with the exception of a lengthened frame to accommodate the much longer 645 Prime Mover, which was also turbocharged, rated at 3,000 horsepower. This locomotive sold quite respectably with 1,221 units sold. The SD40 would debut a few months later in January of 1966. Featuring the same 3,000 horsepower 645 turbocharged prime mover, but in this case equipped with six axles to better get that power down to the ground. The unit again sold very respectably at 1,268 units. To ensure it had the market fully covered, especially to those railroads who were very uncomfortable utilizing turbochargers, EMD introduced another model called the SD38 which would hit the market on May of 1967, rated at 2,000 horsepower and essentially featuring the same frame trucks, etc., 
with the exception of the fact that the 645 Prime Mover did not have a turbocharger. This was not a big seller for EMD, only selling 108 units. EMD would also produce a passenger version of the ST40 called the STP40, modified with a slightly lengthened body to accommodate a steam generator. Only 20 of these units were sold. There was even a variation of this particular model that was based upon the STP45 chassis, allowing for a larger fuel tank, which was delivered to the Illinois Central Railroad. One might wonder how EMD managed to make all these various different variations of this model profitable, and it's really quite simple. These particular units were based upon the modular design that it utilized in its automotive construction, sharing a lot of the main components such as the trucks, the cabs, the frames, the prime movers, body components, etc. This meant that making a modification to one of these models would not cost the company much in time or physical cash investments and thus EMD was able to easily cover all sections of the market without having to spend much in the way of money or risk overextending itself. In sharp contrast to EMD, GE's U30B, propelled by a 3,000 horsepower variation of the company's FDL-16 prime mover, again featuring four-cycle combustion and turbocharging, which would only enter production in May of 1966, would only sell 295 units. The GE U30C would debut in November of that year as GE's sixth axle entry into this ring, but again to somewhat disappointing sales that only 600 units sold, especially compared with GM. GE also attempted to compete in the passenger section of this particular market with the U30CG. Unfortunately, only six of these were produced and they proved derail prone. The principal problem holding GE up at this point was lack of quality control. Earlier U-boat models such as the U-25B and its six-axle variant, the U-25C, gained a terrible reputation for not being reliable in terms of their electronics as well as their prime movers, not to mention rusting out and dissolving like an alka that had been dropped into a cup of water. And while these early U-boat models were designed to be as preferable to the crews as possible, not to mention comfortable, this was far from the truth. Poor build quality meant that items like sunshades were known for falling off, not to mention the fact that these locomotives were extremely sluggish to respond to throttle inputs by the engineer. In short, GE still had a long way to go before it was able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with GM. While the GP40 and SD40 did quite well for GM, there was still plenty of room for improvement. The electronics utilized for these new locomotives were getting ever more sophisticated to keep up with pollution standards and ever-increasing horsepower as well as reliability requirements, meaning unfortunately more maintenance involved. To counter this, EMD would design its new Dash 2 electrical system, which would debut on the successor models. This system was completely modular, meaning the parts could easily be swapped out without much of an issue, as opposed to extensive work on the earlier non-Dash 2 variants of these models that would take these locomotives down for extensive periods of time and essentially lead to higher operating expenses. To this end, EMD introduced its new Dash 2 electrical systems on its new SD40 and GP40-2 models in 1972. While the GP40-2 sold respectably, with 1,143 examples built, it was the SD40-2 that would become the sales darling, selling 3,982 units between January of 1972 and October of 1989. Another upgrade to the SD40-2, which would prove quite a controversy, was its new high adhesion trucks. These trucks initially got a very bad reputation as they were utilized on the infamous STP-40Fs, which had been ordered by Amtrak, the National Passenger Railroad Association for American Passenger Trains, to replace several older ENF units it inherited from the various different railway companies that joined Amtrak. These engines got a terrible reputation for derailing in curves, and initially, the trucks were suspected of being the problem. The situation was so extreme that companies like Conrail actually ordered their SD40-2s to be equipped with the old flexi-coil trucks that were utilized in the previous SD40 model. The SD40-2 was frequently referred to by many rail fans, railroaders, etc. as a small kid in big sneakers. This is due to the fact that GM placed this locomotive on an overly long frame with notable gaps between the porch railings on either end of the locomotive. The reason for this was twofold. First off, the new HTC type trucks required a longer frame to support them due to their increased length. The second reason was the fact that this frame was shared with the larger SD45-2. This would save GM an noticeable amount of money in producing these particular models 
To alleviate the small kid in big sneakers look, a new variant of the SD40-2 called the Snoot was made available. This essentially extended the hood all the way to the actual front porch railing, again in an effort to alleviate the small kid in big sneakers look. Another rare but notable variant of the SD40-2 was the wide nose slash covered cab variation. This particular variation of the SD40-2 was ordered by Canadian National as well as Canadian Pacific to handle the requirements for comfort cab locomotives for Canadian engineers. The combination of the relative efficiency of the 645 Prime Mover, the modular electronics, as well as a brand new truck design, which helped enhance tractive effort, made this engine the perfect locomotive for any railroad operating in the United States. Most Class 1 railroads of the United States at that time owned at least one example, if not many examples, of these particular locomotives. GE would respond with two new models of its own, its C30-7, which would debut in 1976, Again, just like the EMD product, rated at 3,000 horsepower and propelled by the company's new 7FDL-16 prime mover, which was much improved in terms of reliability when compared to its predecessor, the FDL-16. Again, featuring turbocharging and four-cycle combustion, but only selling 1,137 units. And its B30-7, which debuted in December of 1977, and selling only 399 units. While both of these locomotives were notably improved in terms of their acceleration, quality control, especially the steel and prime movers, as well as their electronics, especially when compared with their predecessor U-boat models, the U-30C and U-30B respectively, the fact of the matter was they were still not as reliable as the EMD products. The Dash 7 electronics, though improved over the U-boat series, were certainly not the greatest on these locomotives, causing the reliability issues as well as higher maintenance costs, not to mention the fact that they didn't respond quite as aggressively as the EMD products did to throttle inputs by the driver. It is said that some engineers would refuse to run one of these locomotives that was assigned to one of their trains, just based upon the reputation that the GE locomotives had at that time. While GE was improving, their products simply weren't ready to do battle head-on with EMD just yet, although that would change in later years. In many ways, the SD40-2 was the perfect locomotive for the time, with an almost perfect balance of horsepower as well as efficiency, while the original variant of its much more powerful SD45 series of locomotives managed to sell 1,260 units, with its V20 variant of the 645 Prime Mover cranking out a whopping 3,600 horsepower, which again debuted back in 1965, once the fuel crises that would strike the United States in the coming years hit, these locomotives would go completely out of style. Many thanks to the extremely thirsty 20-cylinder 645 Prime Mover, which really didn't provide very much more horsepower than the 20-cylinder variant at just 600 more, especially considering it required an extra four cylinders just to make this horsepower, but did also unfortunately require a massive increase in fuel bills. The end result, the Dash 2 version of the SD45 only sold 136 units. Many railroads who owned fleets of SD45s would rebuild them to SD40-2 standards, replacing the 20-cylinder 645s with 16-cylinder 645 prime movers, or in some cases taking the cheap and easy way out, disabling four of the cylinders and running the V20 as a 16-cylinder. As successful and well-loved as this locomotive was by all the companies that acquired it, the SD40-2 did eventually have to retire from EMD's product catalog, and this occurred in 1989. But this is by no means the end of the story. This particular locomotive model and its predecessor SD40 series proved to be very easy not to mention popular as a rebuilt locomotive thanks to again the parts compatibility with existing parts and the ease of upgrades being able to be made to these units with not much investment which would in turn make these locomotives more reliable and even a little bit more efficient. One of the more common rebuilds of the SD40 series of locomotives was to the non-Dash 2 models, where the electronics would be upgraded to Dash 2 standards, replacing the non-modular electronics with modular electronics to make it easier to keep them running and again improve reliability. Another more recent rebuild can be found on the Dash 3 variant of this model, done by railroads such as CSX, which in addition to microprocessor upgrades to make the locomotive more efficient, replaces the standard cabs that came with these locomotives with new more modern cabs that are both insulated and air-conditioned. These rebuilds also feature display screens in place of the old gauges, 
Another backwards rebuild, in addition to the SD-45 mentioned before, was the SD-50. Upon its release, the SD-50's reliability proved downright atrocious, with several breakdowns and other issues caused by the overstrained prime mover. As a result, many railroads would elect to rebuild their SD-50s to 40-2 standards, with the older 645E prime mover replacing the trouble-prone 645F and making all of the necessary modifications to make it function as such. Another variation for rebuilds of these locomotives are the Eco variants, such as the SD-22 Eco and the SD-30C Eco, with the SD-22 Eco repowered with a 710 turbocharged 8-cylinder prime mover rated at 2,150 horsepower. The SD-30C Eco receiving a 12-cylinder 710 prime mover rated at the same 3,000 horsepower. Both of these SD-40 rebuilds have noticeable improvements over the original SD-40 design in terms of reliability, with notable fuel savings as well as emissions. One of the more recent rebuild variants of this particular locomotive comes from Wabtec, which now owns GE, in the form of the ET-23DCM. Essentially, this is an SD-40-2 rebuilt with a six-cylinder GE Evolution prime mover, which is also turbocharged that now makes tier 4 admission standards thanks to its GE Prime Mover. In many ways, the SD40-2 represented the pinnacle of EMD's locomotive models. It was a well-balanced piece of equipment, extremely reliable, relatively efficient for the time, not to mention very capable. Many of these locomotives can still be found in service today on short lines and secondary railroads. As mentioned before, a few Class 1 railroads have even rebuilt their SD-40 series of locomotives to much more modern standards with computerized technology, air conditioning, etc. to allow them to serve with these railroads for years to come and continue in service with those Class 1 railroads. And unfortunately for GM, it would be all downhill from here with its coming products, but that's another story. And that's going to do it for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If not, thumbs down. Please like and subscribe, and as always, keep the metal side down.